Welcome to Primate Conversations. Uh, greetings to all our audience uh, in Oxford and all around the UK and the world. Uh, special greetings today to uh, some of our uh, friends and listeners that we know are uh, logging in from uh, South Africa, Scotland, Portugal, USA, Mozambique, uh, and other places. Um, I am Susana Carvalho. I will be hosting today's session. Um, I am very pleased to welcome Elodie Freeman today, who is currently a doctoral researcher at the Primate Models Lab at Oxford. Um, today, I'm not going to delve into Elodie's background and CV, and that is uh, because while she has a very exciting and original pathway so far, the first part of her talk will tell you all you need to know about her career. Uh, what I will do instead is just to share briefly that I do, and I can say we feel particularly inspired when a new generation of scientists really calls our attention um, to the importance of experiencing and knowing the natural world. They, 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 they want the time, they want to have the time to study, to really observe and understand what surrounds their objects of research. In many ways, this goes beyond what many of us studying primates on animal behavior can currently do. In this day and age where everything is rushed, even our field work. So in our research group, we really value and support holistic science. Holistic science takes time. It takes also much more than nailing your ethogram before you go to the field and being proficient at, proficient at working with animal observer or R or any other software. We do need bold researchers who are not afraid to highlight the value of all the anthropological fields and art and qualitative observation in understanding our natural world. So Elodie and Elodie's research represents really this inter interdisciplinarity at its best. Another myth to be debunked is that interdisciplinary researchers are uh, jacks of all trades and masters of none. They are not. Instead, they actually represent a very essential variety within science. We need them if we wish to understand the bigger picture and we want to really contextualize the behaviors and the animals we are trying to, to learn about. Some scientific problems are just too complex. They can't ever be answered by using one tool or one set of skills. So I hope you will enjoy today's talk. I'm sure you will. And as usual, please type your questions in the chat space in our YouTube channel. And Elodie, thank you so much for accepting this challenge and many thanks for uh, joining us today. Thank you so much, Susanna, for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and as Susanna said, my name is Elodie Freiman. Um, I'm a second year DPhil student at the University of Oxford and I'm studying chimpanzee self-medication. Um, I'm supervised by Susanna Carvalho, Michael Huffman, and Catherine Hulbader. Um, and I'm doing my field work at the Bodongo Conservation Field Station in Uganda. And I recently got back from my first season of field work this past October. So as my research is still ongoing, um, instead of discussing results or analyses today, as Susanna said, I'm instead going to talk more about some of the historic figures, natural philosophies, artistic practices, conversations, and ecological observations that have informed my research. Um, I hope to show in this talk from a personal perspective how my background in art, sociocultural anthropology, and botany has helped uh, me study and better understand wild chimpanzees. So I recently came across uh, this image while reading The Invention of Nature, a biography of the naturalist Alexander von Humboldt written by Andrea Wolfe. The image is originally from one of Humboldt's early texts, Essay on the Geography of Plants, which he published with his botanist colleague, Aimé Bonplan. And it is presented in his opening dedication to the respected poet Goethe, who is a close friend of Humboldt's. The figure on the right is Apollo, the god of art, beauty, music, and poetry, depicted unveiling a figure who represents the goddess of nature. This image, as explained by Wolfe, shows Humboldt's firm belief that it is primarily through the arts and our own creative interpretations that humans can understand the natural world. The natural world, as we know, is infinitely complex. And as scientists, we are tasked with trying to better understand different aspects of it through data, observations, and painstaking application of the scientific method. But I will argue in favor of Humboldt's take that we can never really grasp the whole picture, what Humboldt calls the big picture of nature, 
nor translated into a comprehensive philosophy just with numbers, models, and statistics. Instead, to reveal nature's mysteries, I believe we need to engage with its beauty, with its forms, with the poetic stories, with the anecdotes we gather and hear, with the emotional responses nature conjures in us, with nature as a whole, and not just extracted pieces of knowledge from any one discipline. We all, at some level as human beings and as individuals, are interpreting the natural world and filtering it through our own personal lenses of experience, backgrounds, and interests, whether we like it or not. Even after pouring time into making methodologies systematic and as objective as possible, when any of us arrive in the field, there are inevitably biases that influence how and what we noticed. For example, if a researcher has no interest in insects and one flies by, it may fly by unnoticed. But if that researcher has a burning interest in entomology, they may see insects everywhere. So to give a brief outline of my talk today, I will begin by discussing my background and an overview of my research, explaining my decision to tackle my topic as a naturalist rather than just as a primatologist. I will then define the terms natural history and naturalist and provide some examples of the naturalists who translated their own symbolic goddesses of nature through a variety of imaginative forms and creative pursuits. I will then dive into my own fieldwork and the ways I began forming my interpretations of nature in the field. And to conclude, I will introduce a new project I'm working on with my supervisors related to self-medication, which I feel draws on some of the perspectives and values I'll talk about today. So what I've been trying to do in my own research is face this process of interpretation head on and acknowledge which of my backgrounds, experiences, and passions shape what I am primed to notice when conducting my primate fieldwork. As a kid, I loved chimpanzees, poring over Jane Goodall's books and fantasizing about going into the field myself one day. But as these dreams seemed distant, I adopted what seemed at the time to be a more practical passion and started studying plants, specifically medicinal plants. I spent some years in high school and college working in herbariums and as a research assistant for various ethnobotanists cataloging medicinal plant collections. As ethnobotany is a subdiscipline of anthropology, when I got to Brown University in 2014 for my BA, I decided to major in sociocultural anthropology. And it wasn't until the end of my senior year that a professor introduced me to the field of zoopharmacognosy, the study of animal self-medication. After working for a year in film after graduation, I felt drawn to go back to school to study the merging of my childhood obsessions, chimpanzees and medicinal plants, now that this seed had been planted. I wound up in an MSc at the University of Oxford studying cognitive and evolutionary anthropology. And there I finally had the opportunity to merge all of my interests in my master's thesis, which turned into a PhD. Throughout this journey, I've also continued to make art, which has been a lifelong interest of mine and have tried to incorporate some of the scientific topics that I've been learning about into the art that I'm making. While I wasn't planning for it at the time, each of these seemingly disparate interests have played an important role in informing my DPhil fieldwork. To give a very broad level overview, I am studying chimpanzee self-medication. Specifically, I'm trying to figure out how wild chimpanzees socially transmit self-medicative knowledge, the distribution of self-medicative resources in the forest, and whether wild chimpanzees could have unique medicinal cultures. To answer any of these questions, I need to be able to identify a self-medicative event when I see one. And as there are only two known self-medicative behaviors, this also means trying to identify novel medicinal resources. In the field, I collect three different categories of data. The first is chimpanzee behavioral data, coding unusual feeding events and any possible self-medicative behaviors on an iPad and filming all events on a camcorder. The second category is health monitoring data, which I work on with my colleague, Daniel Sempebwa. This allows us to keep track of which chimpanzees have high parasite infection rates and which individuals may be more likely to seek out self-medicative resources. This data is also generally important in long-term monitoring for baseline data that can be used to detect incidences of new parasites in chimpanzee communities. And lastly, I collect botanical samples for further bioactivity testing. So testing whether or not the plants I saw the chimpanzees eating while infected with high parasite loads have actual medicinal properties. And I am working on this component currently at the University of New Brandenburg with Dr. Fabian Schultz. The deeper I dove into planning my research, the more interdisciplinary it became. And the more I realized to study this topic, I would need to adopt a holistic understanding of the forest from the parasites that lie on the forest floor to the plants that can expel these same parasites from the guts of chimpanzees 
to the chimpanzees themselves who are engaged in an ongoing parasite host co-evolutionary battle. I also realized I would need to become a collector, taking fecal samples, botanical voucher specimens for identification, sustainably harvesting plant material for bioactivity testing, and obviously also collecting chimpanzee behavioral data. To study primate self-medication, I had to study many different aspects of the natural world. In other words, natural history. So what is natural history? We hear the word used a lot in historical context, but when you actually go looking for a definition, it gets a bit murky. For one, the term natural history, natural philosophy, and natural knowledge are often used interchangeably. There are many definitions out there, and each is slightly different. The one I've chosen is from Stephen Bone's book, The Naturalists, Travelers in the Golden Age of Natural History, which defines natural history as a former branch of knowledge embracing the study, description, and classification of natural objects, animals, plants, and minerals, insofar as they existed at that time, restricted to a consideration of these subjects from an amateur or popular rather than a technical and professional point of view. This definition from its onset defines natural history as a former field, recognizing the fact that it has fallen out of favor in the scientific community. It was more common before the 20th century for those interested in studying the natural world to explore a number of different natural phenomena and to present their findings through art or visual media. Importantly, findings were often presented in accessible ways geared toward a popular audience. Many scientific texts were published with plates, maps, or carefully rendered figures to accompany written findings. Sometimes these plates were published as standalone books, which I'll show some ex examples of in a minute. It follows that the definition of naturalist is someone who studies natural history. Once again, borrowing a definition from Stephen Bone, a naturalist is defined as anyone with an interest in the natural world, amateur bug collectors, dedicated professional collectors, and formally educated scientists and thinkers. Europe and America in the late 18th and early 19th centuries were experiencing a golden age of science. Society at large was trying to quantify and explore the natural world as quickly as possible. Naturalists were sent out to bring back specimens for the public to see, collecting, defining, exploring, and discovering all types of novel natural phenomena. Naturalists were expected to practice objectivity and adhere to the scientific method. But it was also common at this time for scientists to acknowledge their own subjective interpretations of nature when presenting their findings. Natural history was a mixture of science and art, and this can be clearly seen in the imaginative scientific illustrations and aesthetic visual representations that survive from that era, as well as the poetically crafted travel logs and letters from explorers and geographical societies. I will now present a few historical examples of naturalists who interpreted the goddess of nature in a variety of imaginative ways to demonstrate how many 17th to 19th century naturalists understood their work as an inherently subjective and aesthetic exercise. The first naturalist I wanna present is Maria Sibylla Marion. Marion, in addition to being the first woman to conduct scientific research in South America, was also a well-respected scientific illustrator. She used her art to show the world a novel concept, the life cycles of insects, depicting metamorphosis and insect life histories in a single image. Marion's life cycle drawings are what the scholar Rachel Deleu at Princeton calls an impossible image. Deleu defines an impossible image as a picture of something that should be impossible to depict. So in this case, a process that should take place over a period of time shown in one composition. Here are some examples of Marion's work in which she's translated her discovery of metamorphosis and of a butterfly's lifespan into an illustration that conveys a scientific discovery while simultaneously capturing the imagination. Marion's illustrations were also novel in that insects hadn't historically been painted from life. So the vibrant colors she used in these plates were not only more accurate, but also more awe-inspiring. It was this imaginative way of interpreting her scientific observations and her aesthetic compositions that captured the wonder of this new exciting process and kept Marion's interpretations of nature alive. Another example of this is Alexander von Humboldt, who has somehow been forgotten in our collective memory, but who is credited with shaping natural philosophy and our understanding of the natural world more than any other thinker in history. Humboldt is credited with almost an impossible number of scientific discoveries, but the one I will discuss today is his pioneering work in the field of plant geography. While summiting Chimborazo, a volcano in Ecuador, Humboldt realized that the morphology of plant species changed depending on the altitude and realized that these changes were similar to those he observed while hiking other volcanoes in the Alps and beyond. 
This prompted Humboldt's realization that natural processes, like the distribution of plants, have to be considered on a global scale. From this, he coined the term nature gemailed to refer to his philosophy that the natural world functions like an organism with all of life interwoven. This image, called the physical tableau, was published in his essay on the geography of plants, which he wrote in 1807. The image is another great example of Deleuze's impossible image in that it not only depicts Chimborazo with all of the plant species they encountered along the way, but also includes in the columns on the sides all sorts of other comparative data, like measures of the blueness of the sky, temperatures, and heights of other volcanoes. The image transcends time and space. It is representative while also abstract, informative and imaginative, sobering and awe-inspiring. This image introduced the world to Humboldt's interpretation of nature as a united whole, a completely novel concept at the time. And it was through the artistic rendering of this grand idea that Humboldt could synthesize his theory and present his natural philosophy to the general public. Another influential naturalist was Anna Atkins, often, often considered the first person to publish a book with photographic images. Photography was still very much in its infancy when Atkins began making scientific prints. And Atkins made these botanical prints using a process called cy cyanotype by exposing light sensitized paper to the sun. In 1843, Atkins published her first volume of images in a book titled Photographs of British Algae, Cyanotype Impressions, and went on to produce two more volumes over the following 10 years. Her prints, which started off as relatively simple, got more abstract and creative over time. And what I like about Atkins's work is that you can see by how she's positioned the specimens that she was striving not only to show the world an accurate depiction of what these specimens look like, but also show her interpretations of their aesthetic value. Even in this critical moment, with the transition away from illustration and toward more photorealistic renderings, Atkins's imaginative mind still can clearly be seen when viewing her prints. She managed to capture through their forms and organic shapes an impression of her own interpretation of these specimens' natural beauty. The last naturalist I'll discuss is Ernst Haeckel, who is known for his work studying radiolarians and also for his detailed illustrations of these organisms and other life forms. Haeckel struggled with whether or not to pursue art professionally and famously felt conflicted between his allegiance to the paintbrush or to the microscope. Haeckel had an unusual skill of being able to draw with one eye looking through his microscope and one eye looking at his paper, which allowed him to depict animal life with shocking accuracy. His influential book of plates called Art Forms in Nature, which was published in 1904, depicted various life forms laid out to emphasize their symmetrical morphologies. Art forms in nature, however, was not just a set of examples of life on earth. Rather, Haeckel believed that through rendering na nature's aesthetic forms, an artist could better ascertain a knowledge of nature itself. If the artist is the result of an evolutionary process, just like all other life on earth, then the artist's work is inherently a reflection of our own perceptions, responses, and interpretations of the life forms we see. Taking this one step further, Haeckel believed that human aesthetic sensitivities, so our ability to process and see beauty in art forms in nature, could actually allow us to understand the unities of nature in a way that pure reason never could. His detailed and aestheticized drawings presented his novel theories through a visual media, medium available to the public and actually helped inspire the Art Nouveau design movement. Unfortunately, Haeckel also had some views that promoted scientific racism, which should be acknowledged when discussing his legacy. Specifically, he believed in a hierarchy of races. And to read more about this, you can read Martin Kemp's 1998 article in Nature titled Haeckel's Hierarchies, um, which I've cited at the bottom of this slide. Whether it's Marion's life cycles, Humboldt's physical tableau, into cyanotypes or Haeckel's art forms, these naturalists were translating their interpretations of natural theory and the natural world for popular consumption, cataloging the world, merging empiricism and subjectivity, conveying their own senses of wonder. The transition away from natural history and the fractionation of sciences into hyper-specific disciplines with respective epistemic cultures and methodologies is relatively new. This only really started occurring in Europe when science became professionalized and institutionalized in the late 18th century, as scientific publications were established to focus on specific topics and scientific research became more geared toward constant production of new knowledge. By the end of the 19th century, science had become more difficult to discover and there were fewer places that were truly unexplored. 
all the collecting from the previous centuries had created a stockpiling of natural knowledge, and it was impossible for one person to sustain a comprehensive understanding of all fields and aspects of the natural world. This fractionation had obvious advantages, but it also had costs. As disciplines became more empirical, specialized research became less accessible to outsiders. Additionally, as photography replaced scientific illustration, it appears that the importance placed on translating new discoveries to the public in imaginative and beautiful ways gradually faded. By the mid 19th century, professionalized scientists looked down upon the naturalists and they became no longer viewed as real scientists. Which brings us to today, where subjectivity in Western science is often considered a methodological weakness, where findings are often presented in heavily jargonized and gatekept journals, and where many Western institutions prioritize specialized over interdisciplinary research. There are still some modern day well-known naturalists who have carried on the torch. Examples include Jonathan Kingdon, Wangari Mathai, David Attenborough, Rachel Carson, and others. Naturalism today takes many forms, and naturalists can be artists, writers, activists, filmmakers, conservationists, etc. There are also many naturalists who study and observe natural history as part of their work or daily lives, but who may not necessarily call themselves naturalists. There are also, of course, non-Western schools of thought regarding approaches to studying the natural world that are more open to subjective science and holistic interdisciplinary research. I've talked about the decline in popularity of natural history in, a West, in Western institutions from a very Western perspective, but this is not necessarily the case in other parts of the world. For example, in primatology, there are two main schools of thought, Western primatology and Japanese primatology. In Jap Japanese primatology, subjectivity is actually highly valued. Early Japanese primatologists, such as Imanishi, Itani, Kawai, and Kawamura, promoted the idea that science does not need to be objective or neutral and encouraged a subjective approach to studying primate behavior. Natural history is not extinct, but it has undoubtedly fallen out of institutional favor in the Western world. In this next part of the talk, I'm going to discuss how my own interpretations of nature began to form in the field and how my interdisciplinary background helped me make sense of all of the various channels of information surrounding me in the forest. And also how I tried to keep my sense of wonder alive. Specifically, my background in art, anthropology, and botany informed my data collecting during fieldwork. In this figure, I've tried to represent this idea by showing how all possible natural phenomena and information that one could possibly input or document while in the field is triaged through the filter of each researcher's unique assortment of interests and academic tools. What survives this filtration informs our interpretations of our observations, while other information is inevitably missed. I'm not talking about planned or intentional data collection here, but rather all of the other natural phenomena going on around us. The processes, cycles, and life forms that exist within the forest that may remain invisible unless we are primed to look out for them. So how do each of the tools in my personal toolkit inform my specific research and help me form my own interpretations of nature? I will begin with art. On a basic level, Art has helped me pay attention to my surroundings while at camp and connect with the physical space that I'm in. It's easy when you arrive at camp to consider the research station a home base and the forest the place where the research actually happens. Having the excuse to sit on a rock in camp and sketch helped me pay closer attention in the field itself, how it was built, which animals passed through, which plants grew in the open clearings and not inside the forest, what time the, the sun set, what time the hyraxes started screaming, what time the gray parrots flew home. Drawing drew me out to sit and think and connect with the place itself. Art also helped me memorize. So studying self-medication requires me to be able to identify many of the plants around me in the forest. Plants that were eaten, trees that were satin, leaves that were used for leaf sponging. Learning to identify the vegetation at a new field site is an overwhelming task, especially when you're unfamiliar with the local species. So to help with this, I started a project to paint the species that the chimpanzees commonly interacted with. And I collected samples in the field and spent a few evenings a week painting them. Spending time with these specimens in front of me, looking at textures, colors, veins, and seeds, solidified these species in my visual memory until I could walk in the forest and start recognizing them from the leaves on the ground, the bark on the trees, or even the smell. Not only did art help me memorize, it also made me a more careful observer training my eyes to recognize new animals, plants, specimens, and opportunities to draw. Here are a few more of the paintings I did at the field station. 
This image on the left is a common house gecko that I was able to paint from life. And on the right is a study of a chimpanzee skull that was found in the forest, which I painted to better understand chimpanzee anatomy. I show these examples to demonstrate that there's an endless number of things to draw during field work, from microscopic parasite eggs to landscapes. And for me, knowing how many blank pages I had left in my sketchbook encouraged me to keep an eye out for these opportunities, which made me a better observer and more aware of my surroundings, both large and small. And lastly, art helped me render my interpretations of the animals and plants I was looking at every day into an accessible medium that I could share with others. This image is of a mock butterfly I made in order to bring a copy of the specimen home with me to show my friends and family. When trying to get people to, carry, to care about an ecosystem, specifically chimpanzee and habitat conservation, data visualization, storytelling, and accessible reach, research is critical. In a text-filled world, hand-rendered images stand out and can convey scientific information to the public in a way that feels more accessible than graphs or vectorized illustrations. Importantly, I think scientific illustration helps convey the sense of wonder that I think anyone who has done fieldwork is familiar with, but somehow remains difficult to convey through photography. For those who like art, I believe scientific illustration can be more than just a pastime in the field. It can be a scientific teaching tool for yourself and for others, and for me, it certainly molded and shaped my own interpretations of Bodongo's ecosystem. My background in sociocultural anthropology has also helped me better understand my topic and form a more comprehensive understanding of Bodongo Forest. First and foremost, anthropology taught me the value of acknowledging my positionality. So fundamental to the field of anthropology is the understanding that when studying human cultures, identity and privilege impact our ability to observe and interpret objectively. When studying chimpanzee behavior, we as primatologists are often not asked to state these biases as clearly. Admitting to any subjectivity is seen as a weakness. So instead, we often don't acknowledge that we could be choosing to collect certain data based on familiarity with certain behaviors or ecological variables and not collecting other types or affecting with our own presence the very behaviors that we are trying to study. This does not in any way invalidate primate fieldwork. It just has to be acknowledged that some degree of subjectivity is inevitable. So with these limitations in mind, Ethnographers, when conducting research, try to be a fly on the wall, capturing everything they see, engaging in conversations about all topics and writing everything down. In the field, I adopted this technique for recording all kinds of extraneous variables, variables that before I got to the field, I, I hadn't even considered. These variables included weather changes, wind, facial expressions, other animals that passed by, whether or not we could hear anthropogenic sounds coming from town, snares we encountered, when fruits began to fall from trees, when certain flowers bloomed, good smells, bad smells, anything that could influence behavior. And I wrote these notes up every day and I found it an invaluable way of cross-referencing context when going back through my coded behavioral data. Many of the observations and notes that wound up in these ethnographic primatological accounts came directly from my field colleague, Gershom Mahamuza. Uh, and Gershom has lived at the station for 30 years and is a great example of a modern day naturalist. And this is another way that anthropology crucially helped me in the field. It primed me to value stories and conversations as not only learning opportunities, but also critical components of my research. When I was in the field, I worked with Gershom every day, and there were many days in the forest when we couldn't find the chimps or the focal we needed. And when I first arrived, I had to fight back the feeling that these days were lost or that every minute that passed without chimps, I was missing my chance to observe the important behaviors I needed for my project. But it was also on these days that Gershom and I began to really talk. And from these conversations, I learned the most important facts about the forest, about the chimps and about the human communities around me. We talked about politics, botany, animals, crops, life in Masindi, history, logging, and so on. To give an example, Gershom taught me about the life cycle of fig wasps that live inside many of the fruiting fig species that chimpanzees love so much and how this deterred people from eating the fruits. This information, which I otherwise might not have known, affects my project as it is relevant when testing the bioactivity of these figs and considering nutritional value. There were so many examples of this, Gershom pointing out hidden natural phenomena that I wouldn't have ever seen or considered. He also taught me how to identify plants based on sensory cues, like how Lassio discus smells like root beer and Funtima elastica makes latex. 
He taught me the human uses for some of the common trees, like how Alstonia bunai wood is used to build coffins and cordia trunks are used for boats. Gershom also showed me how ficus exasperata leaves are used as sponges to clean dishes and how to recognize a sick tree by its smell. He taught me all about the other animals that lived in the forest, like those shown on this slide, where the eagle nests were with the bones of colobus monkeys and hyraxes scattered underneath, and how to tell the colobus from the blue monkey calls. He pointed out beehives on the ground, chameleons hiding on logs, insects of all kinds, and the relics of old logging huts. Gershom's ethnobotanical insights and personal perspectives were invaluable to my research on self-medication. Learning about the local uses of the plants I was collecting for bioactivity testing, the overlapping or non-overlapping diets of the other primate species in the forest, and how humans have altered the botanical landscape over the last 30 years, all wound up being relevant natural context for my primate ethnographies. And thanks to these conversations with Gershom, I learned more in one field season about the chimpanzees and about the forest than I could have ever learned on my own. As I mentioned, before starting field work, my science background was in botany. To study self-medication, paying attention to plants that the chimpanzees eat and interact with is obviously important, as it is crucial to be able to identify botanical resources that may be medicinal. However, what I'm gonna talk about now is how my background in botany drew my attention more holistically to e ecological contexts when observing chimpanzee behavior. When you study chimpanzees or any specific animal species, and you are focusing on understanding their behavior, I think it's easy to see the plants and other living organisms they interact with as merely static, functional objects. As you focal a chimpanzee eating the leaves of a climber, for instance, it's easy to forget that the second you and the individual move off, another species altogether could approach and interact with that same plant, eating it, using it for shelter, or even for medicine. Here's an example. The first image on this slide is of a chimpanzee mother-infant pair eating dead wood from a tree in the south of their home range. I had seen a few chimpanzees visiting the same spot following some unusual feeding events, so I set up a camera trap to get 24-hour footage. I found, after watching the footage, that not only the, chimps, not only the chimps were visiting this tree, but also colobus monkeys and blue monkeys as well. Though interestingly, the blue monkeys were eating mushrooms that grew on the dead wood rather than the dead wood itself. This isn't just relevant for self-medication. If this tree is in fact a self-medicative resource, it's also interesting from a disease transmission perspective. If all three primate species are coming to this particular tree almost daily, there is ample opportunity for the transmission of parasites and other pathogens. If we view the forest in this way, as dynamic, remembering that plants are alive and not static, that all living things are interwoven and interacting, we can better understand co-evolutionary processes that we may otherwise overlook. For me, I could also apply this ecological perspective of primatology to the parasitology component of my project. Chimpanzee bodies are in themselves living micro ecosystems in their own right. And parasites and chimpanzees are engaged in a constant evolutionary arms race. Rather than viewing chimpanzees as the sole living agents in the act of self-medication, from an evolutionary perspective, it is necess necessary to consider the dynamic relationships between the other biotic organisms that participate in driving these behaviors. The ecological forces and processes that drove medicinal plants to evolve bioactive defense mechanisms, that enabled chimpanzees to learn which plants to eat and when, and that are constantly at work as selection pressures, forcing parasites to adapt and develop resistance to these defenses. I believe that this holistic ecological perspective can benefit all primate research, not just in topics that specifically seem to mandate an attention to botany or ecology. The wider you cast your naturalist's net and contextualize primate behavior in the broader ecological landscape, the more information will fall in. I've talked about the importance of anecdotes and listening to stories in this talk, and also the importance of capturing the big picture of nature through accessible and comparative scientific research. To do this, especially in the field of primatology, it is important that we communicate more across field sites and research projects. I wanna briefly advertise a project I'm working on with my supervisors called the Chimpanzee Self-Medicative Anecdote Database or CSMAD, which is our attempt to start cross-site conversations within the field of zoopharmacognosy. We've recently launched this survey to compile anecdotes of chimpanzee self-medication. These anecdotes do not need to be published or confirmed they just have to meet a few criteria specified here on the and on the survey's website. We are looking for submissions from anyone who has conducted primate fieldwork 
and has witnessed an unusual feeding event, which is suspect or possibly self-medicative, or noticed any sick chimpanzees engaging in unusual feeding behaviors or unusual behaviors generally. If this is you and you wanna be involved, please head over to our lab website and take a look at the survey. And you can also find the link in the comments. As these events are very rare, working together across field sites to compile a database of these events will be crucial for the advancement of the field and the discovery of new medicinal resources. In conclusion, interdisciplinary backgrounds can be a strong advantage in primatology and grant us the ability to study chimpanzees from a naturalist's perspective. Unique positionalities give each of us a unique skill set and prime us to notice certain things while inevitably missing others. When we start learning about the natural phenomena around us, we start noticing more. This talk is not meant in any way to be prescriptive. Art, anthropology, and botany were the set of experiences that I brought into my field work, and everyone's experiential packages will look different. But what I am trying to encourage is especially for new researchers entering the field for the first time to stop and think. What are our brains and our eyes primed to see? What have our academic backgrounds or hobbies trained us to notice? And how can we find ways of maintaining our sense of wonder during field work while also collecting accurate data and conducting rigorous research? I would like to thank my collaborators, funders, and supervisors for their support on this project, as well as Bodongo Conservation Field Station, UWA, and UNCST for making this research possible. Um, and I will now unshare my screen and open up to questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, Suzanne, I think you are muted. Thank you so much, Elodie. This was uh, fascinating and really inspiring. Uh, I'm very sure our audience agrees. Uh, and by reading some of the comments in the chat, I think that's uh, uh, that's really promising. We do have some questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. So within the topic of natural history, which was one of the uh, one of the themes where we have some questions um, here, um, do you think that, do you think that natural history and art are dependent on each other? Mm -hmm. That means, do you think some of us may stay away from natural history approaches or calling ourselves natural historians because we don't have the skill to paint or draw what we see? I think that's a really good question. And it's something that I was actually also trying to figure out when I was working on this talk, how, how connected or how dependent uh, visual representations of natural historical research is to actually being a naturalist. And the answer is no. I think, first of all, art takes many forms and has many different ways of representing itself. You can be an artist if you dance, you can be an artist. You can be, I, you know, I was talking about how, how visual renderings are, can convey sometimes more than photography, but that's not to say that photography isn't an art in and of itself. And um, I think the medium of photography is an amazing tool to be a naturalist. Um, anyone with a camera, anyone with a phone with a camera, I think can do, you know, much of this, they can be a naturalist in their own way. You can take photographs of things that no one would notice otherwise or from different angles, or um, it's, I think it's about, uh, it's not about what your, you know, the specific medium that you're, that you choose to use. It's about, I think the intention of visually conveying what you're looking at and what you're, or not even, it could be audibly, you could make, you know, music. I think it's not limited to pen and paper. There's so many other ways and everyone's gonna have their own medium that they feel comfortable with. Um, and also everyone can learn how to draw. It's really one of those things that if you just take a sketchbook and a pen, you can trace, you can, you can roller cyanotype kits to take into the field with you. You can, there's so many, um, so it has to do with the intention rather than the medium. Thank you. I think that's really true. Um, I have no skill to 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 draw, but I keep trying to do that when I can in the field. So I think that's a, a very good point. So someone says uh, your work is very inspiring. Um, how would you suggest that those of us who have never engaged with natural history could begin to? Oh, that's a good question. Um, 
honestly, I think reading more about some of the naturalists that came before us is something that at least for me inspires me. Um, like when I went into the field, I came with a bunch of books um, about naturalists. Uh, and it it made me when I was doing my field work sort of notice things that I wouldn't have otherwise noticed and bear in mind kind of this natural, this naturalist spirit that I felt um, before kind of reading about all of those exp like travel logs, expeditions. I'm reading Humboldt's um first travel log now and it's like it makes me want to go back to the field tomorrow. <laughs> so I think reading about naturalists, I think. I mean, going out, it, it sounds cliche, but going out into your backyard and like finding some leaves on the ground and sketching them um, and or taking photographs of them, trying to figure out how you can be a naturalist from your own home, from your own town or city that you're in. Um, and that could even be like going and filming a squirrel on your iPhone for or your smartphone for, you know, 30 minutes and piecing something together, but trying to find maybe a new perspective that fits with your own research um, or identify in your field or in your specific topic, um, the ways in which, you know, information or research isn't being conveyed in a way that's accessible to the public um, or something that when you initially arrived in your field or started with your topic, you felt like there was something missing, like you had to go the extra mile to, to figure out how this worked and try to try to use try to identify that gap and then maybe try to figure out how your own research or your own whatever artistic approach or creative approach can help make it easier for the next person starting on your topic to jump to where you are now that's 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 uh, that's great i mean that's a great insight um indeed perhaps also who knows bringing natural history back to some of the um syllabi uh, in uh, schools would would be very uh, helpful to give the opportunity to uh, engage more with uh, the topic I mean with the, with the, with the discipline overall mm -hmm. um, I think the next question I think you just more or less answered uh, the next question said do you have suggestions for engaging with this natural history approach after field work it feels like the sense of wonder you describe in the field is lost somewhat once we return and are focused on data writing up etc and when we are disconnected from the actual actual research space how can we retain some of this appreciation and wonder later on in the research process so I, think I think it's a good it's a good question. I think, yeah, it's similar. I think if, if I guess one example that I'll give is right now I got home and I've been home since October and I was kind of thinking through this same question from a personal perspective and something just as a, an example of what I've done is I realized I got home and I've never studied parasitology, but my PhD is partially about parasitology. So I, you know, was spending hours, you know, trying to find resources to read about. And I thought, I'm sitting at my desk, I might as well draw them. So my next project is I'm trying to draw different parasite eggs to teach myself the taxonomy and what they look like, how to identify them. So that next time I go to the field, I can look through a microscope and know what, what egg is what. So I guess partially you can engage by either preparing for your next time in the field or just taking the, the part of your PhD or whatever your research is that you don't understand because you never necessarily studied it. It just happens to be a part of it. Um, and find a creative way to teach yourself it that kind of still makes you curious and still gives you, it's a good prompt, I think, to start any creative project is like, what don't I understand and why don't I understand it? Very good, very good. Um, we do have some more questions around this topic, but I'm going to shift uh, to questions that we have around uh, interdisciplinarity and interdisciplinary research. And by the way, we have lots of comments uh, for you on great talk, brilliant talk, amazing talk. I think uh, very inspiring talk. I think the many uh, of our um, friends and colleagues around the world attending really, really felt inspired by this. So I think it's a very good um, sign for interdisciplinary research and uh, natural history. So within this, we have a, a question in an academic world increasingly focused on empiricism, how do we bridge the divide between art and science? That's a good question. <laughs> I think, I mean, to me, the most obvious jump is in data visualization. So whether it's documentary making or whether it's photography or whether it's 
I think one way to really, really show in an effective way the results of your research is through creative medium. So I think, and people get it when you when you show them, you know, visual representations of things. So in terms of bridging that gap, um, I think it's just gonna, it's gonna take, I think, an intentional effort for the scientific community. And there's some great scientists that are doing this. Um, there's a nature, nature article that profiles a couple of scientists that use data visualization in really exciting, cool ways to just, yeah, make your, make your results accessible through beautiful, you know, when, whether it has to be a chart, it has to be a chart. But if, if there's a way to make something beautiful and engaging and accessible, do it. And that might also mean collaborations with artists and scientists and artists working together. Mm -hmm. um, there's some really cool programs around at different universities uh, where this is happening, where scientists are encouraged to partner with artists um, to work on projects together. Yeah, I, I mean, I think collaboration, making things more accessible, and I think in intentionality on the part of every researcher, because um, it takes its extra effort, you know, to go in and with a camera or a film stuff and make a documentary or make a, you know, exhibit of photographs. It, it, it's like an extra chapter of your PhD. But I, I think it's something that's worth taking on just for getting that information out there to the public. Good, very good. Um, I think that's that's really true. And that's, that those are very good suggestions for, yeah. uh, for everyone, really. Um, which naturalist or art or artist or scientist inspire you the most or inspire you to take such an uh, interdisciplinary path? Is there one naturalist who has particularly inf influenced your work or approach? That's a good question. Um, right now I'm on a Humboldt kick. So mm -hmm. I've been really into Alexander Humboldt. Um, that's, and I was, I was reading, but that only happened while I was in the field. There happened to be um, the invention of nature on the shelf and I picked it up and it was like a mind blowing experience for me. Um, so now I've been reading a lot of Humboldt, but I mean, growing up, it was Jane Goodall. And um, I know she's, you know, often considered a primatologist, but reading her books as a kid, it was what a naturalist was to me. Um, the way she talks about nature, the way she wrote about nature, um, that was really one of the most inspiring early uh, naturalists. Um, yeah, there were, I mean, there were a number. I, I, uh, at Anna Adkins, I grew up with seeing her cyanotypes um, because I was very into solar printing as a kid. I had like, as a five-year-old, a little kit. Um, and so when I learned about Anna Adkins, I was totally blown away. Um, so I, unsatisfying because I've mentioned two already in my talk, but um, <laughs> that's why they were in my talk. That makes sense, makes a lot of sense. Um, and do you have any ideas or plans on how to integrate these insights and anecdotes when it comes to publishing your work? It seems so much of this great information is often left out during publishing. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think for me personally, what I'm really going to try to do is film um, a short documentary while I'm doing my fieldwork this next round. Um, I filmed some, I tried to film some um, while I was there the first time. And of course, I think anyone who's done field work knows it's challenging. You're holding your camcorder, trying to take behavioral data, something cool happens. You like want to be reporting on your camcorder. So you wind up, all the footage I had was kind of like the low, the slow moments where the chimps were just hanging out, eating and grooming. Um, but I, yeah, also filming you life around camp, um, life in the lab, life here. I'm in New Brandenburg testing some plant samples. Now I'm trying to film. So I'm trying to just document um, as I go without kind of knowing where my research is going to go yet because I'm only halfway through my second year. Um, so yeah, documenting I think is really important. You always have the option of getting something together. Um, for me, it's an, I'm hoping it'll be it'll look like a three short publicly accessible um, YouTube documentaries, which will be peer reviewed hopefully and accessible for everyone to see to not only show kind of what my results are um, and get my results back to, I mean, globe, share them globally and with the scientific community, but also with the people in Uganda that have been helping me in my research there. Um, and also possibly some interviews, we'll see. Um, but 
yeah, I think so. I think uh, yeah, short a short documentary series I think is is for me how that's going to look. But also hopefully continuing to do illustration. I hope to illustrate my PhD with my own botanical drawings, um, and yeah, find as many possible ways as I can to incorporate art uh, and science. That sounds really really uh, exciting and um, yeah, in a very very um, eclectic way to to share. Uh, the science you do. Indeed, I was thinking, you know, sometimes people um, thinking about the, 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 the short series of, of, doc, of short docs we are doing with some of the field work we did last year in, in, in Mozambique and how, you know, in the, in the, in the old days, people will, would worry, oh, you're, you're, you're sharing this footage. What is, if you need it for a publication afterwards, it's not going to be completely original. And then when you look at it after 30 years, you have hundreds, thousands, thousands of hours of video footage that were never shared, that were never shown, yeah. um, that you never did anything with them because you use tiny video clips for your publications. Um, and so I think it's also, you know, a mentality shift that needs to happen. Um, yeah. And I think I'd rather have other, I mean, I'd rather have data or information used than not used. So if it could be used by someone for something interesting, to me, that's the most important component of the research and also I was I meant to also say that it's I think really important for sharing your methodologies and obviously I think people keep those close to their chest because that's something that's you know you want to it's it's yours and it took time and you don't want people you know there's this instinct to not have people just copy exactly what you're doing but first of all it's really hard to copy what what, what people do because everyone does it differently which is kind of the point of my talk like no one really can do what you do because you have everyone has their own set of skills but also I think um starting from scratch as a field worker and trying to figure out how everything works um, and what and arriving at camp and not really knowing how, how anything works. I think that problem, I mean, I think that's also a beautiful thing, but I think that publishing your methodologies or, or documenting your methodologies is so helpful for making it seem to, you know, other, the next generation of scientists, like I can do that. <laughs> I can, you know, get a camcorder and, and, you know, follow it, it demystifies, I think, this process that seems so impossible when you're preparing for the trip or considering do, starting field work. When you see it, it seems all of a sudden like it's something that you can do too. So that 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 uh, links beautifully with with the next questions about uh, actually your fieldwork and um, your scientific study of of, of the chimpanzees um, of Budongo. So the first one is how how did your first experience of fieldwork shape your view of the natural world, and was there something that surprised you or changed your views? Everything. <laughs> yeah, I think. I mean, I grew up in New York City, so. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to get out into nature on the weekends, but I, um, being, I mean, just being surrounded by all sorts of animals that I had never seen before, trees I had never seen before, smells I had never seen before. I think this overall sense that the forest is, you always hear the forest is alive. I didn't really understand that before my field work. <laughs> everything is alive, everything's moving, everything's making sounds. There's so much going on from like the tiniest, tiniest bugs on the ground to the, you know, the chimps right in front of you. Um, I mean, yeah, everything was, I think for me, it was learning. And I said this in my talk, but it was learning how the, learning to name the plants and then learning the histories and the cultural significance of the plants that really sort of changed my view of the forest. Because when you walk in the forest and you can identify the trees, it's like a different forest. You, you suddenly kind of feel like you have friends all around you who, whose name you know. And when you can identify them, it's suddenly you start, you know, you start looking out for them. You start seeing, you know, differences in barks or um, you know, when you see a diseased one, you can suddenly identify, you, you, can, you can smell it and it smells different than what you're used to. So I think just spending time in the forest. And also I think one thing that was, it sounds really mundane, but it was something that I noticed kind of early on that when the sky was gray in the forest, it gets dark. And then, and, and you really feel this like darkness in the forest. And then the sun comes out and the forest changes. It's a totally different forest. Like 
different sounds, different colors, different everything. So I think, and it sounds so basic, but it was just really a matter of the sun coming and going that would change my mood. It would change what I saw. It would change everything, like the feeling um, of the forest around me. That to me, I'd never experienced anything like that in nature. Thank you so much um, <laughs> for that, for sharing your experience with us. Um, we have a couple of questions on the, your, like I said, on the, your study of self-medication. Uh, mm -hmm. One is what aspects of chimpanzee self-medication behavior do you hope to examine? And why mm -hmm. is this such a challenging area of research? Maybe you start there and then I add the other one. We have a question by Ian Redman, my, more specifically about the method. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm specifically looking at the social transmission of self-medicative behaviors. So I'm interested how um, chimpanzees transmit medicinal knowledge across generations, um, because there are, you know, a number of captive studies that show that they can be socially transmitted, um, these behaviors, and that there are um, cultural differences or cultural cultural traits um, that can be passed down. So it's not just instinctual, instinctual or genetically driven. So if that is the case, then how are the younger generations of chimps learning what to eat when they're sick, when to eat, how much? So there's a lot of questions that we have, especially without you know, language as we know it. Um, when we're sick as humans, we can say, my head hurts or I'm gonna take an Advil or, we give you know verbal cues that let us know that let others around us know that we're sick or that we're taking medicine um, and how much. So without that, how are they how are they transmitting that information? And do chimpanzee communities have uh, cultural traditions between communities? Um, so my methodologies. I mean, so I'm I'm following the chimps. I'm I'm looking. I'm recording what they're eating. Um, I'm keeping track of their health data so I know who's sick. When, and sick, I'm, I'm by that I mean measuring um, parasite load. So I know who has high parasite load, who has diverse parasite load. Um, and then, as I said, I'm, I'm collecting any unusual resources they eat and I'm taking it for bioactivity testing to kind of triangulate um, whether or not. And then I should also say that I'm looking at health monitoring uh, after those events as well to see if there's an improvement in the state. Um, and so I'm hoping to triangulate sort of these certain anecdotal events that I've seen. Um, and, and determine whether or not it could be self-medicative. And then when it, if it turns out that it is, I'll look at my video footage and I'll code that video footage from those events and hopefully look for patterns that could help me determine whether or not there is any sort of communicative signaling or anything going on um, that we wouldn't necessarily notice if we weren't aware that it was a self-medicative event that we just observed. Um, so that's kind of the, that's the elevator, that's the shortened version. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we have been here for quite a while and there are so many questions. So I'm just going to say, I'm going to ask another two questions to wrap up. Okay. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to um, tell our audience that, that please feel free to email Elodie uh, to contact, to ask your questions. I know that there has been a lot of um, feedback in, in our chat and we have plenty of questions. Um, so I think it's a topic and it's um, something that people are very happy to just talk about and listen more and more. Um, so we have uh, Ian Raymond is asking you if, um, or uh, saying parasite X can be difficult to identify down to species. Are you using DNA to confirm which nematodes, et cetera, you are finding? Um, not for the parasite eggs. Um, we have a uh, an unusual species of proglotid that we are using DNA to identify. Um, for the eggs, we're just using, um, we're, we're, we're just identifying on a, on a more general level based on um, what we can see through the microscope. Um, but we have photographs of the slides um, for further identification. Clarify, and we're counting, um, we're looking at not only quantity, but also diversity uh, of parasite load as well. So um, we're getting a general sense of whether or not they're not only highly infected, but whether or not they're infected with a number of different types of species as well. And we're also keeping track of um, unusual character characteristics of you know, feces or any other unusual uh, wounds or health states that we see as they come up 
um, and, and kind of general health monitoring as well as the peristology. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Elodie. And finally, I think a question uh, that uh, is coming from Jacinto and actually links to your call for contributions, I think uh, uh, that you are, that you had up in your uh, last slide. Um, mm -hmm. How can other researchers or even your colleagues who are conducting field work at different sites and places around the world contribute to your study? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, well, yeah, that's a great question. I think, I mean, in my in my perfect world, everyone would think self-medication is the coolest thing and would look out for it um, wherever they are. But I think it's actually not that hard to keep an eye out for potential events. I think if you're in a field site and you see a chimpanzee, you don't even have to be doing the health monitoring systematically if that's not part of the protocol at the site. But you, if you see a chimpanzee eating something unusual or interacting with a unusual resource in some way, whether it's you know rubbing or, or processing in a way that doesn't seem common um, or that people haven't seen before, I think trying to get it on video is the most important thing. Um, and then following up, seeing if, you know, seeing if that's ever been done in the site before, seeing if you can get health data on that chimp um, or other primate species. Um, yeah, fo yeah, following up in the next few days to see if any sort of unusual symptoms pop up. Um, and once, if you do have it on video and you have, and, and also what I would say is writing down every detail about that anecdote. So where the chimp was, what the chimp was eating, how the chimp was processing it. Um, and yeah, demographic information about that chimp. And if you have that, then, and, and we have enough of those anecdotes, then it becomes easier for us across sites to piece together, mm -hmm. wait, this isn't actually that unusual, you know, chimps here, 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 and here are all doing this, you know, once a year in the wet season when parasite loads tend to be high. So I guess the more data, the better. Um, but if you are interested and you are you, you do happen to, to see an event like that, getting it on video, I think, and writing down as much information as you can um, is incredibly important. And contacting you. And contacting me too. <laughs> and submitting it to the database. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. This was truly inspiring. And I hope um, we will hear a lot more about your research. Mm -hmm. um, uh, soon, I know you, we will. Um, I'm going to close the primate conversations of this week, thanking everyone who joined us today. And just a heads up that uh, next week's talk will happen exceptionally at 10 a.m. to accommodate time differences. Uh, so please don't miss the seminar at 10 a.m. next Tuesday by Andy and on cross-border collaboration to save endangered primates. It's going to be really exciting. So thank you, Elodie. Thank you, everyone. And see you, many of you, next week. Bye-bye for now. Bye.